Um, hi everyone, my name is Julia Madison. Um, I'm gonna be the technical manager for this session today on diet quality, diet cost, and food security, chaired by Esther Omosa. Thank you so much for taking part in ANH 2021, and we look forward to a really robust and interactive session today. A quick reminder that everything you need to access the conference materials and program can be found on the ANH Academy website at anh-academy.org slash ANH 2021. Before Esther takes the conversation forward, I have a few technical announcements to ensure our experience is as smooth and interactive as possible. First, this session is being recorded and will be posted on the ANH Academy website following the conference. Second, all participants have been muted, but please introduce yourself using the chat function. Let us know your name, where you are joining us from, and the organization you work with. We encourage you to share your webcam feed throughout the session, but if your connection is bad, we recommend turning your video off. Later in the session, we will open up the conversation with a Q&A session. If you have questions, we invite you to share them in the chat box throughout the session and during the presentations. And we, are, we will do our best to answer them throughout the session in the chat box and during the Q&A session at the end. Last, if you have any um, technical issues throughout the session, please check your audio settings and your internet connection. You can always try to reconnect to the session using the same Zoom link you used to join the session today. If you have a technical question, please private message me using the chat box. So I think that's it from me. So over to you, Esther. Thank you very much, Julia, and uh, good uh, afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone. And thanks for joining us in this parallel session on that quality, that cost and food security. We are joined by um, uh, five presenters this after, uh, today, and uh, uh, each presenter is going to take about eight minutes. And we request that uh, we take the questions uh, which we shall answer and have some discussions at the end of the presentation. So we have a diversity of uh, presentations from across the world and uh, different uh, presenters. So our first presenter is uh, Surabi Chetuvedi, who's coming to us from the Division of Epidemiology and Biostatistics from St. John's Research Institute. Um, our second uh, presenter is um, uh, Mishen Lu, uh, who uh, represent Ellen uh, from uh, University of Georgia. Uh, next is Kate Schneider, who joins us from Johns Hopkins University. And then uh, we'll have Ton Tina Bond, uh, sorry, Sen from London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And last but not least, we have Talia Spalin, who joins us from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. So the, we welcome the first presenter, um, uh, going to take us uh, uh, the, the title of the presentation uh, from uh, Surabi is uh, um, on the uh, division of women's labor across productive and reproductive activities and the effect on household dietary diversity, a case study of gender sensitive social protection net uh, safety nets. Um, and then uh, the next uh, uh, presentation uh, will be uh, on the role of consumer preferences in shipping that quality in sub-Saharan Africa. And that is um, from Lou. Then Kate is going to share uh, with us on nationally representative estimates of the cost of that uh, adequate diets, uh, nutrient level drivers, and policy options for households in rural Malawi. And uh, the fourth uh, from Tina Bond um, is on the production diversity. Uh, sorry, uh, production diversity is associated with increased dietary diversity for children through perceived access to a range of foods in Eastern Uganda. And Thalia is going to uh, share with us on mental health related to food security and, um, and nutrition, a systematic mapping of evidence. So uh, we go straight to um, our first presenter um, and over to you, Surabi, and the other presenters will be presenting uh, just as the, the previous presenter finishes. And our chair is going to uh, uh, ring a bell or alert us when we have five minutes, sorry, when we have two minutes into the end of the eighth, uh, eight minutes. So please be alert and um, thanks. Over to you, Surabi. Thank you so much, Esther. Uh, I'll just be sharing my screen. Um, uh, 
Hi, can you all see the screen and the slides? Um, yes. Okay, I'm assuming everyone can. All right. Um, thank you so much, Esther, for the uh, introduction. Today, I'll be sharing um, a research on that looks at division of women's labor across productive and reproductive activities measured in terms of time use and its effect on the household diet diversity score, uh, which is an indicator to look at food access and also quality. The study, uh, the data that I'm using is from a study that was uh, conducted and designed by my co-authors uh, from St. John's Research Institute. Um, they are also the co-authors on the paper. So this is a mixed method study that was done in the landlocked state of Bihar in India. It was done in two districts of Gaya and Nalanda. The sample had 2,026 households that had children less than five years of age. Uh, the intent of the study was to capture the consumption and expenditure data of these households, but also look at the food production specifically Food, nutrient dense foods like uh, pulses, green leafy vegetables, milk, egg, and chicken. The survey was the survey was done across two different seasons: the Kharif season and the Rabi season in India. And uh, I am using the data from the survey that was done during the Kharif season, so that is July to September 2019. This is the framework that it has been developed by. Uh, Johnson and colleagues. And this is one of the first uh, agriculture and nutrition framework that really highlighted the need to look at time use as an input to study nutrition security, nutrition status of children and women. And this has sort of formed the foundation of the question that, that uh, we'll be discussing today. The household diet diversity score, which is the dependent variable um, in, in the study that was constructed using the 12 food groups that are listed on your screen. The recall period for each of these uh, food groups was seven days. The time use uh, data was collected using a modular time use survey that was embedded in the larger consumption and production survey. The respondents were mothers of children who were less than five years of age. And the recall period was uh, for capturing the time use uh, for different activities was a typical or an average day in the past week. Um, using the framework that I had shared uh, on the slide uh, earlier, we looked at activities like childcare, household work, cooking, shopping, uh, cleaning, water collection, and others, we clubbed it together as reproductive uh, activities. And the time that was allocated towards these activities was then termed as reproductive time use. The activities that generated income or even had the potential to generate income, so even underpaid labor or like unpaid labor work on agricultural fields, that was classified as productive activities. And then the time allocated to these activities was then termed as productive time use. So this is the uh, distribution of the household diet diversity score in our sample. 24% um, of the households reported uh, essentially had good diet diversity, uh, which implies they had a high um, household diet diversity score of 10 or more. Um, and this is the cutoff that we took based on the work that has been done by um, McConnell and colleagues, but through their work in Ethiopia. What we found was in the sample, the average household diet diversity score was about nine. Uh, and the households that had a HDDS of nine or below, Primarily, they were missing um, animal source foods, foods like fish, seafood, um, eggs, meat, and poultry. And I think it's interesting to highlight that because when we, these foods are also considered expensive in the Indian context, and especially in the context of the districts we were studying. And the cost of nutrient adequate diet is, is a very critical aspect. And we found that you know, even in our sample, this, this was something that we felt is a, a bit of an issue. In terms of time use distribution, uh, the reproductive time use 
all the respondents reported in, in, uh, engaging in reproductive activities and the median time use that they had uh, towards reproductive activities was about 380 minutes per day. On the other hand, only about 51% of the respondents said that they were engaged in productive activities. And the median time use was also a lot lower, that it was about 20 minutes per day. So we further looked at you know, what took up the substantial amount of, uh, what activity took up the substantial amount of, uh, of time and under the reproductive activities. And most of the respondents said that they, they spent most of their time on household shows followed by childcare. So given HGTS with the count variable, we use Poisson regression to test the association of HGTS with productive time use and reproductive time use in two different models. Our thinking was that, you know, increased time allocated to productive activities will have higher incomes, which will then improve the diet. On the other hand, we thought the reproductive activities uh, increased time towards that implies there is a, uh, you know, implies better care, more time attention to cooking, and hence improve the diet. So what we found when we ran the model was that uh, there was a significant and though small 1% increase in household diet diversity score for every additional hour that was uh, spent towards reproductive activities. However, uh, what we found was that um, there was a significant decrease, in about 1% similar decrease, but about 1% decrease in household diet diversity score when there was an additional, for every additional um, hour spent towards productive time use. So a, a finding was that there is a competing effect of women's labor uh, towards productive activities and reproductive activities. And there is, this basically highlights that there is an opportunity cost of time. We also found out that the wealth of the household, the uh, education of the household head, the household size, and also the household's production diversity when it comes to what they produce uh, among the nutrient dense food, that really, uh, that was also significantly and positively associated with um, household diet diversity score. So I don't know how I'm doing on time, but um, so, you know, as we, um, this is my last slide. So when we think, uh, what I want to say is that uh, while there is a competing effect of uh, division of labor on, on productive and reproductive activities, I think we need to interpret these results with a bit of caution because while there is a competing effect that would this competing effect would be reversed um, and even reduced um, by by ensuring that the policy design and the program designs uh, for agriculture for nutrition child development programs as well they really sort of are cognizant of these kind of the, the, these kind of dynamics that are imposed on women in the household um, for example, if there is a focus on reducing the drudgery of on-farm jobs, um, a lot of time women in low and middle income countries, especially in the setting in Bihar, they, they really spend a lot of time working on the on-farm jobs in uh, agriculture, which are often underpaid or even unpaid. So if the, the, if the agriculture mechanization schemes, the extension services, they are design taking into account these, these uh, you know, ask or demand on uh, women's time, I think they will be able to improve the access of these schemes to, for these women, thereby reducing and reversing some of these competing effects. Uh, the other thing that I feel um, I had mentioned in one of the slides when we looked at where, what what comprises the substantial amount of reproductive activities, um, the time, it, it was basically looking at household shows, but also childcare. Um, and so one thing that I want to add over here is that it will be helpful that there, from the policymaker side, there is investment in quality center-based childcare, which could again, not only just benefit the children 
but redistribute some of this uh, the the time that women spend in in taking care of the children which sometimes is not even the nurturing quality care uh, so if if the policy makers they actually invest in uh, improving the quality and setting up quality center based child care they could benefit the children but also they could really allow women to access skilling opportunities manage their time better and maybe actually make use of the um interventions and programs that focus on economic empowerment and the, the last thing that i also want to add is that there is uh, you know we should not just focus on improving the efficiencies of the off on uh, on farm labor but also um, figure out ways and how we can encourage these women to access uh of farm jobs maybe along the agriculture livestock value chain that can then sort of uh, provide them the higher remuneration potential that can kick in the income effect and that would sort of again um, reduce the 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 reduce the impact of the competing uh, effect that we are seeing um, in in our results so uh, just want to just want to end by saying that we hope this research um add the adds to us the evidence that corroborates or reiterates that the agriculture social protection and child nutrition programs they need to be more gender sensitive thank you i'll stop there thank you very much surabi for that insightful presentation on how we need to balance reproductive and productive activities um so next uh, you did well on time next we are going to have our second presenter who is uh, Michelle Lu uh, sitting in for Ellen and uh, her presentation is going to be on the role of consumer preferences in shaping that quality in sub-Saharan Africa. Over to you, Lu. Thank you, Esther. Can you share my screen? Can you see the slides? Okay, uh, hi everyone. I'm Mei-Chen Lu from the University of Georgia. So today I would like to present a paper titled The Role of Consumer Preferences in Shaping Diet Quality in Sub-Saharan Africa. The role of income growth and lower food prices uh, in improving food security has been well recognized in the literature. However, there is little evidence on how those two uh, simulations or uh, interventions will and in fact, the diet quality, whether they, this, these policies will reverse the overconsumption. So in this paper, we add new comprehensive demand modeling evidence from Sub-Saharan Africa. The overall goal of our paper is to understand how diet quality responds to food price changes and total expenditure changes in Sub-Saharan Africa countries. We have three object objectives here. The data used in this paper is part of from a living standard measurement study, and we intend to uh, do the analysis for six countries, but the paper is still in progress. So today I will present the results of Tanzania, Nigeria, and Malawi. Uh, we use a two-way exact a fine stone index model to modeling the uh, intake elasticities. If you are interested in our modeling, you can read our another uh, separate working paper, which tell you that all the details about the EV model. So in this paper, we try to simulate the impact of two commonly proposed uh, interventions. One is cash transfer. We set the size of the cash transfer to be 20% of the median household expenditure levels among poor households. And we assume the household will use 70% of the transfer to uh, increase their consumption rather than invest or saving. And the other intervention is price voucher. So we set it to be 25% the price discount to, uh, to five certain groups. Here is our results about the diet quality and expenditure growth. So this figure shows the, let me zoom in. Yeah, this figure shows the, nutrient intake in response to 1% increase in the uh, household expenditures. So here, okay, here Q1 means the uh, poor household and Q4, this column, this column means the uh, wealthy household. So for example, the, this blue square means it's the uh, 
if, if the total expenditure of the poor household increased by 1%, then their fat intake will increase by 1.6 percentage. So we can tell overall the nutrient intake elasticity is larger in magnitude for the poor household than wealthy household. And then we look at the how the nutrient intake responds to the food price increase. So here the blue or the blues, uh, blue indicates when the nutrient intake will increase as the food price increase and the, the red indicates that the nutrient intake will decrease as the price increases. So we found that if the when the when the when the household substitute to more uh, nutrient more nutrient rich food, then when in response to a food price increase, then the such increase is good for overall nutrient. For example, the increase in the X. But if the household response to uh, food increase response to one food food group increase when they substitute to a less nutrient rich food, then such increase is bad for the overall nutrient intake. For example, the in price, in price increase in the vegetables. Now we uh, simulated the impacts of this uh, cash transfer and the price voucher on dietary energy intake. So here we can see that all the, the cash transfer is the most effective in uh, increasing the dietary energy intake. And the size of the impact is, uh, is the largest for poor household, which indicates by green. Then, and they are larger than for the wealthy household, which indicates by, the, by uh, pink. Yeah. And the, the size of the price voucher uh, simulate the impact of the size of price voucher simulation on green stables, stables and statue stables are larger than than the simulations for uh, fruit, fruit and vegetables or the animal soft food. Now we want to know whether our simulation will make the over over consumption problem worse. So we measure the dietary balance as a share of calories from fat, protein, and sugar, uh, sorry, fat, protein, and carbohydrates. So we, before the same, so the uh, green, green dash line is the upper limit of each nutrient, and the, the line is the level before the simulation, and all the marks shows the level after the simulation, and we can, we do not find significant evidence that those interventions worse the dietary imbalance. And now we want to know whether those simulations will improve the under uh, consumption situation. So we, the y-axis here is the ratio of the household intake of these nutrients to the estimated uh, requirements, estimated average requirements. So if the index equals to one, it means just met the requirement. And if it's below one, which means under consumption. And we can tell that the households in Nigeria and Malawi have sufficient nutrient intake, while the poor households here in Tanzania have, uh, have some insufficient intake. And the, the effect of the cash transfer is uh, to has the largest effect to improve to reducing this gap. Yeah. And in the end, we look at the impacts of the simulations on nutritional quality, uh, quality of diets. So we use the nutrient rich foods index as our measurement. Uh, if there is no change after the simulation, then the this y-axis should be zero. So from our simulation, we can tell that the cash transfer can uh, increase the nutrient density of dyes for the poor household, which indicates by green, in Tanzania by 0.6 standard deviation. And for poor household in Nigeria, it increased by 0.2 standard deviation. And for Malawi, it's 0.1 standard deviation. 
and we found that for all the all the uh, price voucher simulations will in, in, increase the nutrient density of diet for all the poor households. And, but but the, uh, the patterns will differ by countries. Yeah. So uh, in summary, our uh, paper found that consumer income growth is strongly associated with improved diet quality, especially for poor consumers. Lowering uh, of food price could be effective in improving diet quality, and price vouchers targeting poor consumers increase diet density of diet of diets, no matter which food category is targeted. And the patterns differ by country. For example, greens are most effective in Tanzania, while starchy stables are more effective in Malawi, and animal sourced foods are more effective in Nigeria. And for wealthy consumers, all simulations do not help to improve diet quality as much as they do for poor consumers. So uh, our our findings provide this all this uh, evidence for the policymakers to make decisions when they try to increase the diet quality for specific countries. Yeah, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lou, for that insightful presentation on the linkage with the cash transfers or social protection programs and uh, data consumption. Uh, so next, uh, we are going to um, have Kate Schneider. And just before Kate Schneider comes, I'd like to remind us to put all our questions or comments on the chat box, and we shall handle them at the end of the presentation. So Kate Schneider is going to share um, on the nationally representative um, Sorry, nationally representative estimates of the cost of adequate diets, nutrient level drivers, and policy options for households in rural Mar Malawi. Welcome, Kate. Thank you very much. Sorry, my title's a bit of a mouthful there. And some of you may have seen some of uh, some earlier work on this project last year. And so I left off some slides last year with future research, and here I am to present uh, the direction that we have taken on, hopefully. Um, answer a few of the questions that might have been left in your minds for those who were here last year. Oops. There we go. Um, I'm gonna go briefly through um, some methods, a bit of a whirlwind, but I'm happy to answer questions afterwards. Um, the main method in this body of work are least cost diets, which are the lowest cost way to put together a combination of foods that meet the a set of dietary or nutrition constraints. And for these purposes, we use nutrient adequacy as defined by the dietary reference intakes. These cost diets are useful to measure access to a nutritious diet, but most analyses that have used this method have focused on the nutrition needs of a representative individual, most often a woman of reproductive age. Many of you might have seen the state of food, uh, food insecurity and nutrition, the SOFI from FAO this year. Um, where uh, the affordability of healthy diets um, featured in that. Um, and you'll see that they did that for, um, for, um, men, for women of reproductive age, excuse me. In many places though, including Malawi, families eat from shared plates and they procure food and meals as a unit. And so the cost for one individual might not be the same as the per capita cost for the whole household if they need to meet a set of nutrient needs for, for diverse members. So last year, I presented a method to estimate the cost for a whole household, which met a set of shared nutrient requirements. And I'll summarize that method again in a moment. But when we did that, and we estimated the feasibility and affordability of a shared diet for households in rural Malawi, we found that the diet is only feasible in the main rural markets about 60% of the time, and that it's unaffordable for over 70% of the population. And so these um, findings motivated the work that I'm presenting today. So we wanted to understand a bit more about what was driving those results. So to better understand why this shared diet is not always available and what drives its cost, we investigated the cost of individual nutrients, which some of you, like I said, might have seen last year, um, and uh, but then that left us, you know, with remaining questions. So we look at how household size and composition might be driving the results. And then we took the shadow prices of individual nutrients, which I also shared last year, and I'll go over briefly again here. Um, and analysis of nutrient shortfalls from other um, 
from our analysis of current diets, and we developed a set of realistic policy options that could potentially fill these gaps. And so in um, this paper that I'm presenting now, we modeled eight policy scenarios to try and identify which options might be the most promising to improve the availability and affordability of a shared diet for whole households in rural Malawi. This project relied on a combination of household survey panel data from 2013 and 2016-17, consumer food price, uh, food prices from the consumer food price index, which came from 25 district center markets in nearly all of Malawi's rural districts, a new food composition table for Malawi, and then the dietary reference intakes of human nutrient requirements. And so we estimate the least cost diets meeting the shared nutrient requirements for every household. And then we use those results to also identify the shadow prices um, which are um, identified as the dual result from the linear programming solution. And this reflects the amount that the diet cost rises for the lower bound constraints or falls for the upper limits for a 1% increase in the requirement or limit. We then identified the best food sources of the nutrients that we found to be lacking in diets and expensive in the food system. And um, we found these to be eggs, fish, ground nuts, and milk. And so we developed these eight um, these, well, we developed eight policy scenarios, um, including three different prices for eggs, which is why you see a list of six here, um, based on the current situation and things that can reflect kind of realistically achievable changes in availability or price or both. And that could be achieved through a range of actions at multiple entry points in the food system. And we selected that last scenario that you see there, soil biofortification for maize and this is with selenium, based on recent work, which some of you also might have seen presented at ANH last year, that's shown selenium biofortification of maize in Malawi is an effective, pragmatic, and cost-effective way to deliver selenium fortification, and it results in a desirable quantity in the maize as prepared by households and consumption has reduced deficiency. Just to back up for a quick moment, the way we get to the shared nutrient requirements starts with identifying individual nutrient requirements defined by the DRIs for every individual observed in all of the households in the panel survey. And these take the form of both lower and upper bounds, defining an optimal intake range with sufficient but not excess nutrients for optimal growth and long-term health. And for micronutrients, we use the estimated average requirement um, for, the, for the lower bound, and this is the appropriate requirement for populations and groups. In the upper level for micronutrients where symptoms of toxicity are possible or for sodium to reduce the chronic disease risk, we use the upper level or the CDDR for sodium. And then um, we use the acceptable macronutrient distribution range to define the bounds and percent of calories from each macronutrient. We then develop the shared nutrient requirements for every household based on its observed composition. And we define this on the basis of nutrient density needs, where the level of nutrient density in the shared household diet is set at the amount required by whichever member has the most demanding need or the most restrictive upper tolerance for nutrient density defined per nutrient. And then the energy need is the sum of individual energy needs. And this leads to a diet with sufficient total energy for all individuals. And where if each individual eats a share of the diet meeting their own energy needs, all their other nutrient needs will be satisfied and won't exceed any upper bounds. And then we use these nutrient requirements to solve the least cost diet problem using the food prices in the household's district of residence. And so uh, to, to solve for that least cost diet, we, um, we solved the mathematical optimization problem you see here, which identifies the combination of foods in specific quantities that meet the set of shared nutrient requirements. So it stays within the lower and upper bounds and meets the energy need at the lowest total cost. So turning to our results, we see the cost and percent feasibility of these shared household diets. The mean cost is $2.32 per person per, per day. And that's in 2011 US purchasing power parity dollars. And we find that the diet's feasible just under 60% of all household months. We see that oops, um, riboflavin is by far the cost, costliest nutrient in the food system, which some of you might recall from last year, and that the diet cost rises $2.57 for a 1% increase in the household's requirement. 
B12 is the next most costly at 14 cents increase for a 1% increase in the requirement. And then at the upper bound, we see that allowing 1% more copper into the diet would reduce its cost by about 24 cents on average. So first, we looked at how these shared nutrient requirements change relative to the individual requirements to try and draw some insights about why there are so well, such a large percentage of infeasible results. And so what you see here is an illustration of exactly how the necessary nutrient density, uh, lower and upper bounds, uh, change with the shared diet compared to what it would be for individuals to meet their own minimum needs. And so uh, what you can see is that the shared requirements need 141% more iron, 96% more zinc, and 67% more vitamin C and phosphorus. And that sharing also reduces the upper bound. And so we see how much this optimal intake range actually narrows comparing the individual requirements to those under household sharing. And it tightens the most for vitamin C, iron, phosphorus, and zinc. And we can see the costliest nutrients, riboflavin, B12, niacin, selenium, are not among those where the range tightened the most when using the shared requirement. Um, and so this gives us some insight, but not um, entirely about what might be driving that infeasibility and, and cost. And so to explore this further, we look at how household composition might be driving the results. And here you can see the, the most common household compositions that together comprise 50% of all households. And so we see that household that feasibility um, varies uh, more with household composition than it does with cost. And comparing just the two most common household compositions, we can see the addition of teenagers reduces the percent feasibility from 70% to 39%, but that when it's feasible, the cost per thousand calories it, it differs, but not by much. And so this um, simplifies household structure just so we can look for patterns. But one thing it doesn't show us is anything about household size, which is what we investigate next. So we ask how total household size affects the results. We wanna know the relationship between different types of members in terms of nutrient needs, which we call household complexity and how that's related to overall size. So the figure on the left shows membership complexity increases with household size up to about 10 members after which it kind of levels off. Um, so household size and complexity of membership are interrelated, meaning uh, larger households aren't just scared, scaled up smaller households, but that they require a greater nutrient density because they have more complex membership. And we can see as they grow in size, that cost of a thousand calories of an adequate diet, shared diet increases, reflecting that increased complexity. Finally, we turn to the policy scenarios. So what you're looking at is the change in diet costs under each simulated scenario relative to the base case, uh, which is current conditions for the same households, markets, and months where it was feasible in the base case. And we see here selenium soil biofortification stands out clearly with a median decrease in diet cost of 50%. It not only reduces the total diet cost almost in half, but also results in near universal feasibility, eliminates the shadow price of copper and reduces that of B12. Um, so this means that greater availability of selenium in maize prevents the need to meet selenium and other requirements from foods that are dense in copper or from more expensive foods that are not dense in copper and enter the diet to supply the remaining nutrients while staying within the copper upper bounds. Um, and so what these results reveal is that although selenium didn't have the highest shadow price, the inability to meet selenium needs without exceeding upper bounds hindered the feasibility of a solution at all. So just in conclusion, we found riboflavin is the most expensi expensive nutrient in the food system. We find evidence that household composition affects the feasibility of the diet, but once it's feasible, the average cost per thousand calories doesn't differ as much. Um, and that house, as households grow in total size, their membership gets more complex and the cost of a thousand calories of a nutrient adequate shared diet does go up. We showed how scenario modeling can be used to identify the nutrients hindering the availability of an adequate diet and to identify the most promising solution. And we find selenium to be the nutrient hindering the feasibility of the diet and that biofortification of maize in Malawi could be a promising option as it's already been shown by others to reduce selenium deficiency and alleviating the shortage of selenium in the food system can make adequate diets available at almost half the average cost for households who eat shared meals. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Kate, uh, for that. Um, next, we are going to have uh, uh, Tina uh, take us through the production diversity um, and how it's associated with child um, increased in child dietary diversity. Uh, so uh, quickly, and Tina, please observe the eight minutes uh, so we have sufficient time left for discussions. Over to you, Tina. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I can hope you can see my slides and only sort of one screen there. Um, yeah, so thank you for joining us today and uh, for coming for this presentation. Um, so I'd like to talk to you about the uh, how household agricultural production diversity is associated with increased child dietary diversity um, through perceived access to a range of foods in Eastern Uganda. And my slides aren't shifting. There we go. So in Uganda, 27% of children under the age of five are stunted and 10% are wasted. Uh, only 15% of children aged between six and, six and 23 months uh, have a minimum acceptable diet. And agricultural programs have generally focused on increasing the quantity of food produced rather than the quality, even though it's becoming more apparent that uh, child nutrition is affected through multiple pathways. So increased agricultural production diversity has been associated with increased dietary diversity in low and middle income countries. Um, however, the evidence remains mixed. And this is uh, probably because of competing pathways that might contribute to sort of effects in opposite directions that might cancel each other out. So we set out to do a study to examine uh, if increased household agricultural production diversity is associated with child dietary diversity in an agricultural community in Uganda, and also to determine the extent to which women's time use in agriculture and women's perceived access to food groups might uh, mediate that association. We did that by doing a cross-sectional study in 20 villages in uh, Eastern region in Uganda, and as shown here on the map, where we invited women with a child aged 12 to 23 months um, and collected data through some instructive questionnaires and direct um, observations, including uh, children's weight data. So we calculated child dietary diversity and household agricultural production diversity according to WHO recommendations using seven food groups. Um, for women's perceived access to food groups, we created a scalar mediator, and we did this by aligning it to the seven food groups used for child dietary diversity. So we collected the 12 commonly consumed foods uh, perceived excessive from the women, where women scored foods uh, on a scale from one to three, from very inaccessible to very accessible. We then took one food to represent each of the seven food groups and then summed the, the perceived accessibility scores to create a scalar mediator that ranged from seven to 21 and without units. Women's time use was then um, calculated by summing 15 minute intervals uh, throughout the day's um, direct observation in agricultural um, activities. And the table here shows you some examples of what those activities might be. We then went on to identify a causal web of how production diversity might uh, influence our dietary diversity, which is a big spider web, which we reduced down to this direct cyclical graph, which focuses in on two main pathways for which we could hypothesize unidirectional flow effects and no measured, um, no unmeasured confounders, which is essential to doing uh, unbiased mediation uh, estimates. So the hypothesis was that increase in production diversity would affect child dietary diversity in part through increasing the perceived access to food groups. And despite women's uh, extra workload in agriculture, which might negatively affect child dietary diversity, either directly or through the perceived access to food groups. So we calculated the pathways in linear structural equation models, where we included a priori identified uh, confounders for links between each of the variables included in the model. We also included a priori identified interactions, which we limited to uh, interaction terms that were central to our main hypothesis, because unfortunately we weren't powered to stratify the full analysis. So the focus here was on agricultural time domain, uh, empowerment in agricultural time domain and deprivation status of women. So the sample we investigated, we had 211 women child dyads, the median age of women were 25 years, most were married and had uh, up to primary or tertiary education. 
Uh, about half of the sample of children were girls. Uh, the, the mean age was 17.3 months. And most of the children were reported to have a usual food intake at the time of the survey. So the, the dietary diversity score ranged from one to six food groups with an average of 3.6. The production diversity ranged from one to seven food groups uh, produced in the previous year with an average of 4.9. The uh, time spent in agriculture ranged from zero to 375 minutes with an average of 30 minutes per day. And the perceived access to food groups ranged from seven to 21 with an average of 15.6 on this unit less scale. So contrary to our hypothesis, uh, production diversity did not seem to affect the time women spent in agriculture in our study, nor did uh, women's time in agriculture seem to affect the perceived access to food groups. We did observe a weak association of women's time use in agriculture with child dietary diversity, but only in the group of women who worked up to 30 minutes a day and not in any of the other groups. We then decided to reduce our directed uh, cyclic graph, graph to just calculate the effects via um, perceived access to food groups and these are the results. So we didn't actually observe any total effect of the production diversity with child dietary diversity. We did, however, observe when we went into the mediation analysis an indirect effect of production diversity channeled via perceived access to food groups. So every uh, increase in food groups produced were suggested to increase the women's perceived access to food groups score by 0.7. And every integer increase in the perceived access to food groups score then increased child dietary diversity by 0.04. Uh, food groups. We also observed a uh, pathway acting around, so independently of perceived access to food groups. And this would be the pathway that would include any other mediators, either measured or unmeasured in our study. And this pathway suggested that there was a negative effect of production diversity on child dietary diversity. Going a step further, looking at our interaction terms, we would see whether there was a suggestion of uh, an interaction between perceived access to food groups and deprivation status in the leg of the, the model that modeled perceived access on child dietary diversity. So that meant that women who were least deprived seemed to be better able to translate this increase in perceived access to food groups from an increased production diversity into better child dietary diversity. Uh, and with an average of 0.1 additional food groups for their children. This wasn't the case when we looked at uh, the, the women where deprivation increased. Um, so sort of on average, what we saw, that sort of the, the, the main outcome of that would be that we saw a potential for child dietary diversity to increase by 0.6 food groups. If we look at the range from the lowest to the highest of production diversity in our study. And just in conclusion, uh, we didn't see any total effect of production diversity and child dietary diversity, so an effect that would go via any mediator. And this was the case in both the linear models and also when we looked at curved linear associations, which have been suggested uh, in previous studies. So this, this lack of total effect uh, was probably because of the competing pathways uh, where our associations acted in opposite directions. So we had the positive indirect effect via women's perceived access to food groups. And that seemed to be canceled out by a negative effect observed through any other mediators in our model or not uh, measured. So in any other mediator that didn't, uh, that wasn't affected by access to food groups. Uh, and contrary to the hypothesis, we did not see that women's time use in agriculture um, affected the access to food groups or child dietary diversity uh, considerably, and production diversity didn't seem to influence women's time use in agriculture either in our study. However, we did see that the, the amount of time spent in agriculture overall was quite low in our study, so that might be one of the reasons. So bottom line of this analysis is that mediation uh, analyses and methods are important when we're looking at these very complex um, processes through which uh, production diversity might affect child dietary diversity because we do see that individual pathways, when we start splitting up these total effects, may act in opposite directions. And in that way, uh, it may look like there is no effect, 
when we might actually have effects via some pathways in one direction and via others in another direction. So thank you very much for listening and to all of our funders, the participants for the team, colleagues and supporters. Thank, thank you very much, Tina. Thank you very much. Um, and next we are going to have uh, Talia Spali um, on uh, mental health related um, to food security and nutrition, a systematic mapping of evidence. Uh, over to you, Talia. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody joining. Um, I am Thalia Sparling and I'm going to speak today about systematic mapping of evidence on food security and nutrition as it relates to mental health. So I'm going to, um, I'm actually going to jump straight into the map as some of the illustrious presenters in the ANH Academy Week have done before and sort of start backwards. Um, because I'm on a Mac, I need to um, show you this uh, exit out of PowerPoint. So I will uh, get onto the methods after I give you a little whistle stop tour of this uh, resource that we've created. And this resource is open for consultation on our website. Um, as if you've seen other of our Imana maps before, this might look familiar, but it is a new topic. So this all evidence, which is um, almost 1900 studies are mapped onto a fixed framework of these groupings of food security and nutrition measurements in the columns and mental health um, groups of mental health measures here on the rows. And um, you can actually now expand out these different um, segments. So you can see a further um, grouping of these, um, these sort of categories. And when you, in the cells, you'll see both different colored and different sized bubbles. So the size of the bubbles corresponds to um, the number of studies and the color in this particular map corresponds to the population. And you see a little summary of this cell. And then you can also click on the cell and you see um, it open basically a running bibliography, which you can toggle off and on your um, areas of interest. And that will change this listing and see each study as you click through it. And you can download these references, you can filter them, etc. The other feature of these maps, these interactive maps that I'm going to show you are uh, basically everything we code for becomes an interactive filter. So you can see a long list here of characteristics of study design, sample size, the type of analysis, the hypothesized direction of exposure and outcome, as well as a lot of um, different types of measures and methods. Um, and lastly, different um, groupings of population, more nuanced categories, as well as um, countries, regions, publication year, et cetera. So just to show you one way that this works, so if I only want to see systematic reviews, meta-analysis, and RCTs, I can update the map, and it will basically um, filter out everything, uh, filter in everything I've selected. So I'm going to, that's your whistle stop tour and I'm gonna go back um, to the presentation and um, describe a little bit of how we came to create this map um, and uh, some of the analysis that's come out of the mapping exercise. So we really intended to zoom out a bit and instead of doing another systematic review on for instance, dietary diversity in, and depressive symptoms in only perinatal women, we really wanted to look at all literature that is empirical, um, that links mental health and food security and nutrition um, in healthy and general populations. So I won't bore you with um, too much of this PRISMA flowchart, but we, just to say that we identified um, over 40,000 records from uh, three different databases from January 2000 until the middle of 2020. 
And we screened and coded uh, almost 2,000 of those. So to bring you into some of how we look at um, what you do with a map like this after it's published, other than making it available for future research and further meta-analysis, we look at different um, characteristics and trends of the literature overall. So on the left um, of this uh, Sankey chart, we have the proportional groupings of food security and nutrition measures, and on the right, um, equally distributed um, measures of mental health um, by group. And then these chords um, are proportional to the number of studies linking each of these groupings. This um, map shows um, the darker saturation countries are the places where there, there are the most uh, studies that were mapped. And uh, as you can see, there is um, a dominant theme in, in uh, North America, Australia, Europe, but we do see increasing evidence coming out of Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, um, and South America. And we also have, we've coded for regions, so you can see studies only about the global context or low and middle income countries. Then we also were curious about how um, people have hypothesized this relationship because there's quite a lot of um, different factors and it's some people have really hypothesized that it's quite cyclical or that it's uh, intertwined and these bars um, are segmented by the study design in our map um, and most of them run sort of as with food security and nutrition as the exposure or the um, independent variable to mental health as the outcome. Um, and the, uh, the majority are um, observational studies, but we do see some systematic reviews, meta-analysis, um, RCTs, a handful of qualitative work etc. And then there are some studies, just, if, just over 50 studies that go actually in both directions. Usually these come from longitudinal cohorts. And these, um, these graphics, yes. oops, sorry, should I continue? Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. That's all right. Um, these graphics were created by Megan Dini, my uh, mapping partner in crime, and uh, they show different ways that we can look at the populations represented in the across this body of literature. Um, you can see that the last bar is actually these cross-cutting populations. So some are within just, for instance, adolescent females, but some are about um, women and their children, or children and their mothers, uh, or families, or parents, etc. So as you can see in this constellation, um, the labels are a little bit small, sorry about that, but um, the, the majority of that cross-cutting literature is about the mental health of pregnant women and mothers uh, as it relates to the food security and nutrition of their children. And then I'll just end with the, the analytical bit of this uh, with a very simple message that the interest at, of these intersections is really increasing uh, since we've looked in 2000. And in 2020, remember, we only searched for half the year. So um, this certainly is a growing body of literature, but it hasn't been um, systematically summarized. So our next steps are to to synthesize some of the best evidence from each of these intersections and create an evidence framework that will drive much more systematic inquiry. So I'm putting some links um, here for those who want the slides uh, to where you can access this map and some other resources. And I just wanna say a huge thank you, especially to Megan Dini, who really has um, been such a huge help. And then the whole entire ANH working group on mental health. Um, as well as our incredible global mental health lab collaborators from Teachers College at Columbia University. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Talia, um, for that uh, uh, insightful presentation and thanks for showing us where we can access that, those maps. So now we, are, we have about eight minutes. Um, so we are going to open it out for uh, any quick questions and um, um, I think, uh, Julia, if you can uh, read for us any 
um, three questions and we can have them uh, answered very quickly. Um, but if the audience allows, we can have uh, one uh, question per presenter. So that uh, we go into our, our time about uh, two, three minutes into, into the time because we have about seven minutes. If that's okay, uh, Julia, you could uh, please um, uh, filter for us uh, a question for each presenter. Sure. Um, so she, Shiva just asked in the chat a question directed at Tina. Could you please share your thoughts on combined role of markets or market connections on dietary diversity, women and children, along with the household production? Yes. Thank you for that question. Yeah, so this is this is a really interesting question and something I think there's a lot of research that's gone into um, because production diversity is sort of the main two pathways that are often mentioned in the literature is through sort of direct uh, improvement of access to foods for the consumption of the child and then the other one would be through the economic pathway of, of perhaps selling and gaining income from your from your um, produce. It, it's a very difficult question, um, and I'm not sure I can actually answer it. Uh, I do feel like our results indicate, so the results indicated that women who were, were better off were able to translate the production diversity into greater uh, child dietary diversity. What would be really interesting to know there is whether that is an effect of women actually selling the produce they have and then spending the money on improving diet or whether it might be to do with women having more income available to actually um, towards other expenditure, and they are then uh, eating the actual available and accessible uh, foods there. And that's something that we would really like to look into, but unfortunately we haven't been able to do in our current study. So I'm sorry, it's gonna be a, a sort of non-answer answer <laughs> to that one, I'm afraid. Thank you for that. Um, Julia, next question, please. Sure. Our next question is for Kate. Um, Lisa asked, did you assume that all family members eat the different foods in equal proportions? Thanks, Lisa, for that question. And I hope I've tried to answer some of the other questions that were directed at me in the chat. I'm happy to follow up as well. Um, that's a great question, Lisa. And this is a strong assumption of this method. But what we assume is that the linear programming um, returns a solution with a set of foods in certain proportional quantities that together have a certain meet the nutrient constraints. And so what we assume is that every person eats a quantity of that diet that meets their own energy needs. So the foods themselves, we assume everyone eats the same proportion of foods relative to other foods. We don't assume, for example, that each person eats a specific proportion of the diet relative to the other people, except that it, based on their energy, I guess we do. So yes, um, that was not the clearest way of, of describing it, but um, the assumption is that everyone has their energy needs met and that they get a share, the same share of plate of foods, if you can imagine it that way, um, out of the, the total household diet. Great, thank you, Kate. Um, so our next question is for Surabhi um, from Kalyani. Do you have information on the kinds of productive labor these women were involved in? Some like small scale entrepreneurial jobs could be done at home while caring for a child slash cooking while others like agriculture would be harder. Thank you so much for that question. Um, actually, this was a bit uh, one of the, the it was one of the limitations that we faced. Uh, and I think in general, that's a limitation of the time use methodology. It's much harder to differentiate the time spent on childcare versus, uh, you know, household chores. And, uh, you know, maybe, uh, especially, especially any work that is being done at the household level. So we were not able to differentiate um, the time that was spent on childcare and uh, you know any other potentially small scale entrepreneurial activity that was happening however in the and one of the limitations i mean one of the limitations that we faced particularly it was a modular time use survey and not the detailed 15 minute time diary kind of a format so we were not able to capture those finer details 
But uh, what we did try to, how we tried to address was that we specifically, when we were asking questions on household chores, we listed out uh, specific activities and we asked them um, under paid employment, what were the kind of jobs that they were doing? So we tried to ensure that there is, um, you know, as much as possible, there's not an overlap of uh, productive activities at home uh, versus, you know, productive activities at agriculture uh, when people, when women are involved in agriculture. Um, and as far as like, yeah, so basically we were not able to delineate the time spent on childcare versus doing other activities, but I guess that's a bit of a challenge in general uh, across all time in survey. So I don't know if I answered the question very well. I hope you got some of the information. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rabbit. Yeah. Great, thanks. Um, we have um, time for maybe two more questions. The next one is um, for Mi Chen, um, went from Kalyani, wondering if your simulations take into account possible impacts of cash transfers on food prices in the market. Thank you. Yeah, this is a very good uh, question. So. Actually, we assume that the market price did not uh, are not affected by the cash transfer, but ideally we should take this into account because it's an equivalent problem. We should consider the consumer side and the producer side. So, in our next paper, we intend to uh, in incorporate this part. Yeah. Thank you. And there's another question. I can do a quick response. So. For Diana, we use an unconditional cash transfer. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Lou. Uh, Julia, we have any more questions? Yeah, I think um, we have time for a few more. Um, I'm not sure if this one was already answered. There's a lot going on in the chat box, but this one will be for Kate. Um, did you take into consideration the effects of household budget constraints? Yeah, that's a great question. I actually shared in the chat. Um, we did, and we looked at the affordability relative to total expenditure and food expenditure of these least cost diets. And, and we estimated not only the shared household diet that I presented today, but we also estimated what that cost would be if each individual person were to be procure a diet that just met their own individual needs. And so at the household level, that's a lower cost way of meeting everyone's nutrition needs. And so we did look at that, um, but that was in a separate paper that um, I put a link to in the chat. It's currently under review, but um, there's a working paper version online. Thanks very much, Kate. I just wanted to also ask a, a follow-on question on that. Uh, in cash transfers, you find that it's very uh, difficult to, to know at what point um, the transfer actually starts translating into uh, diet, diets uh, or improved diet. Were you able to determine uh, the tipping point or um, exact um, what point uh, the increase or the cash transfer actually um, translates into uh, diet? Um, consumption. Is that for me or for Mei Chen? For you. We didn't estimate cash transfers specifically. I'm sorry, maybe I'm misunderstanding your question. Oh, sorry, I'm actually uh, confusing you. That was for Lou, <laughs> sorry. Okay. Yeah, yes, I thought it was asking me. Yeah. Yes, so yeah, we, we were able to uh, we were able to measure the improvement on the nutrient consumption of the nutrient intake. Yes, but I didn't show it in these figures because it it was too many numbers, and I figure it will be better to visualize it. So, but in our paper, we have the parameters. I don't have it in hand, so because we measure like six different nutrients, so we have an across nineteen food groups. So it will be a lot of numbers, yeah. I think, uh, Julia, we can take two quick questions.
Um, sure. So I think we have time. Yeah, maybe one more question. This would be for um, for Tina. Doris asks, what are your recommendations for a real scenario, such as in my country, where huge funds have gone into improving agricultural productivity and a very marginal or no effect on child nutrition? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so I think, first of all, it's going to be very important to try and tease out these pathways so that you might, you might have these um, interventions affecting in, in very different ways. And I think it's, it's very difficult to sort of to, to put a finger on exactly why it isn't working in that, in that uh, specific community or that specific country. Um, so probably my maybe slightly annoying academic answer would be that we probably need to stay, take a step back and really sort of with, with um, longitudinal analyses where we can really see the direction of the and flow of effect and see which variables are affecting which outcomes throughout these pathways, then try to identify in which scenarios would certain interventions be effective and in which scenarios might they be counterproductive. I hope that answers that question. Thank you very much. Any last question, Julie? Um, I think that's all the questions we have right now. If um, anyone else would like to um, ask any of the questions for the presenters, um, their information um, should be on the website or they can drop it here in the chat right now. Um, so. Just wanted to give um, a big thank you to all of our participants and presenters today. We are now gonna wrap up this session, but before you head out, I just have a quick poll that I'm gonna launch just to help us um, get some feedback from you all and help us improve um, the sessions going forward. If you have any additional comments, please reach out to us at anh-academy at lshtm. Um, .ac.uk and someone will drop that email in the chat box now. Um, and um, so please answer that poll. And again, before you leave as well, um, we have our main poster presentation session um, happening in the next 20 minutes um, using the spatial chat system. So please go on our website to find the link to access that as well. And we have um, various other social hangouts and side events throughout the week. Um, so please, again, check out the program on the website um, as well. So thank you again for all of our presenters, our moderator, and for participating today. And it seems like most people have answered the poll, so I'm now going to um, end the session. So thank you again for joining us, and please visit our website for more information of the rest of the research conference this week. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.